Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Regeneron. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Greg Polin. I'm professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and director of the Mayo Vaccine Research Group. We're going to talk today on SARS-CoV-2 specific monoclonal antibodies, a topic that's been much in the medical literature. When we think about managing COVID-19, there is a spectrum, of course, from public health prevention measures such as masking and distancing, vaccines to prevent infection, and then therapeutic or treatment options for managing the infection. Those uh, include dexamethasone, antivirals, convalescent plasma, and of course, monoclonal antibodies, and recently in the news, cytokine or chemokine inhibitors. When we think about issues involved in managing COVID-19, we start by recognizing the stunningly high burden on healthcare systems. There's been difficulty in predicting which patients will be at risk for progression, there have been few proven therapies to prevent COVID hospitalization, morbidity, or mortality, a limited vaccine supply to date, and issues surrounding what the duration of immunity will be, particularly in regard to new variant viruses, and then availability, access, and cost of monoclonal antibodies, which we will discuss later. When we look at an animation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, like all coronaviruses, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a single-stranded RNA genome surrounded by a lipid protein coat. The RNA uh, genome encodes for four major structural proteins, including the membrane or M protein, the nucleocapsid or N, and the envelope or E protein, which contribute to virus particle assembly, replication, and release. The fourth one, the spike protein, binds to the host cell receptor, ACE2, and fuses the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, allowing viral entry into the host cell. So when we think about monoclonal antibodies, that is important to understand because monoclonal antibodies are neutralizing recombinant uh, antibodies directed toward viral spike proteins, but in this case, they are recombinant IgG1 antibodies, which fortunately have a long half-life on the order of 30 days and can be used in therapy. The other thing that uh, we need to start with is an understanding of this S protein. It consists of two subunits the trimeric S1 subunit, which has the receptor binding domain, and the S2 subunit, which helps with membrane fusion and trafficking inside the host cell. So neutralizing antibodies are key in providing protective immunity for viral diseases. They act by preventing viral cell binding and entry. Monoclonals then, against SARS-CoV-2, target the receptor binding domain, or RBD, of the S protein, thereby preventing the S protein from binding to the host cell or ACE2 receptor. And therefore, what monoclonal antibodies do is block the attachment of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to the host cell a critical step, of course, in viral infection. So the role of monoclonal antibodies in treatment is still evolving. There are a number in clinical trials, but the potential benefits being examined in outpatients with mild to moderate disease 
include reduction in viral burden, prevention of worsening of symptoms, and the chance to reduce hospitalization rates. There are four monoclonal antibodies that have received an EUA or emergency use authorization from the FDA. Ban, uh, lanivimab, uh, edacevimab, casarivimab, and imdevimab have all been, have all received this EUA. And you see that two of them are in combination. So let's look at these trials. The scientific basis of these studies is the complications and death result from high viral burden. So the hypothesis is that a decrease in viral burden would lead to clinical benefit. So in other words, by decreasing viral titer, might we decrease hospitalization symptoms and death? So let's take the LAYS study, which stands for blocking viral attachment and cell entry with SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody. So there's a BLAZE-1 study, which is a phase two, three trial of the single monoclonal antibody, which we'll just call BAM, and BLAZE-4, which is a phase two trial, a combination of two non-competing monoclonal antibodies that both bind at different regions of the receptor binding domain. And then another two non-competing monoclonal antibodies, again, that both bind at the RBD. So let's look at phase one, phase two clinical trial. You see the inclusion criteria there. So it is meant to study adults with mild to moderate COVID-19. There were several treatment groups, BAM at 700, at 2,800, at 7,000, and placebo. So if we look at viral load, now this is in all patients, treated and untreated, we notice a couple of interesting things. First of all, that the viral load is higher in hospitalized patients at all the time points, 1, 3, 7, and 11. The other is that even in non-treated patients, viral load goes down over time. And in fact, you see that the cycle threshold a proxy for viral load in inverse relationship goes, the cycle threshold increases, meaning that viral load is decreasing over time. So in the BLAZE-1 trial, if we look at hospitalization and we're looking at the far, the far uh, right two columns of placebo and incidence versus BAM, uh, and you see that the uh, incidence of hospitalization in BAM 700 was 1%, and it's 2% for 2,800 milligrams, 2% for 7,000 uh, milligrams. So across those pooled doses, 1.6, compared to a hospitalized incidence in those who received placebo of 6.3%, so a significant difference. If we look at symptom scores, so COVID symptom scores from day two to day 11, you see the difference in placebo in red and BAM in blue. And from day two to day six, you see a pretty marked change in symptom score from baseline. And you see that up until day seven, it is better in the BAM treated than in the placebo group, after which it starts to um, uh, go, go to day 11 in parallel. This is part of why I showed you the first graph that in part viral titer will go down over time. What we see in this graph though is that is hastened. That is the change from baseline is greater in the BAM treated arms. We can also look at symptom score from baseline for each of the BAM doses compared to placebo. And you see that the uh, sort of uh, P green 700 milligram dose, which was the dose selected, um, results in a marked decrease in symptom score from baseline compared to placebo. Quite a sharp decrease, in fact, uh, uh, right after day one, after infusion. Now the BLAZE-1 phase two, three clinical trial is similarly designed. Only here, 
you not only have BAM at 700, 2800, and 7000, but you have BAM and etacevimab at 2800 milligrams versus placebo. So I'll just call that combination therapy. Um, so if we look at the primary endpoint, which is the change in viral load from baseline to day 11, you see that with BAM 700, uh, all the way through each of the monotherapy arms, there was not a significant, statistically significant change in viral load compared to placebo. But if we look at the combination of BAM plus etacevimab, you do see a statistically significant change in viral load of minus 4.37 compared to placebo at minus 3.8. If we look at that change from baseline uh, uh, to log viral load across day three, seven, and 11, you see that the combination of BAM and uh, etacevimab is in the blue box, and you see that falling over time. In fact, that fall in viral load was associated with a statistically significant reduction in viral load at day 11, with P being 0.01. We can also look at viral load by CT value. And again, you see that the change in viral load was statistically significant for the 2,800 milligram dose in, in uh, 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 orange and the combination uh, therapy arm in blue. Now we can also look at symptoms. This is change in total symptom score from baseline versus placebo to day 11. And you see that if we look in uh, change in symptom resolution compared with placebo, so I'm looking at the middle column, you see that with BAM 700, it was statistically significant, not significant with 2,800, nor with uh, the combination therapy. But if we look at the change in mean total symptom score compared with placebo, we do see significant differences with BAM 700 and combination therapy. This equated to a reduction in the number of hospitalizations or ED visits. Now they were small enough in number to not reach statistical significant, but they certainly point that way. If we look at safety in the BLAZE-1 study, the primary concern was if infusion-related hypersensitivity or cytokine release-associated reactions within six hours of infusion. And you see here, there really are no significant differences across uh, mild, moderate, or severe uh, reactions compared to placebo. So no serious events were reported with BAM, and the rates of uh, adverse events were similar to placebo. BLAZE-2 is a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of BAM versus placebo in adults at high risk of exposure because they reside or work in a skilled nursing or assisted living facility. The uh, study design calls for BAM versus placebo with an efficacy assessment over eight weeks. We do not yet have those data, but we look forward to them in terms of prevention of infection and prevention of symptoms uh, of any given severity in those already uh, uh, infected. So this will be a very interesting and represents a prophylactic use of the antibiotic of the monoclonal. All right, we'll go now to the COVE-2. As I said, it's a mixture of two non-competing monoclonals, casarivimab and indevimab. Um, and each of those is given in equal doses in the cocktail. Again, set up very similar to what we saw with the BLAZE trials. In this case, it's the combination at 2.4 grams at 8 grams or placebo. So the pre-specified virologic endpoint was a time-weighted average change from baseline in viral load through day 7. And what you see here are differences from placebo uh, overall, and the most interesting, I think, on the far right-hand side, in those who were antibody negative, that is, who had not yet initiated 
a COVID-19 immune response as measured by antibody. And you see there uh, pretty significant drops in uh, uh, log copies of viral load on the order of 0.6 or so. So if we look at that viral load over time, now this is difference in change from baseline to day seven, you see that the reduction in viral load in the treated versus the placebo group is significantly different with the fastest reduction in the first three days after receiving either the cocktail at 2.4 or at eight grams. We can then divide that into the serum antibody negative on the left and the serum antibody positive on the right. And you see that that reduction in viral load among treated patients was much more striking in those who were antibody negative at baseline. Now think about why this is. For those who have not yet initiated an antibody response, a monoclonal that rapidly drops uh, uh, viral titer is very helpful. In the serum antibody positive individuals, these are people, while they do have a change in viral load, particularly in that first few days, it's fairly parallel to that of placebo because they've already initiated a immune response that will drop that viral load. Now we can also look uh, uh, more closely and these, if you will, are divided uh, into four graphs looking at greater than 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, and 10 to the 7. And what, what I want you to focus on is that that mean reduction in viral load at day 7 was about two logs greater among the treated versus placebo patients once we get into viral loads of 10 to the 5 or better. And you see it uh, even more extremely at 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7, as one might expect. All right, uh, interim analysis, since this is an ongoing trial, is to look at the percentage of patients with at least one medically attended visit. So in the pooled cocktail, it was 3%. Uh, and for the serum antibody negatives at baseline, 6% compared to placebo at 15%. So we're seeing early indicators of benefit in decreasing medically attended visit. Again, this is an interim analysis. If we look at interim safety, and again, looking at uh, AEs of special interest or grade two or greater, all, all the way to grade four hypersensitivity or adverse events, you see that they are uh, indistinguishable really from placebo. So the bottom line results here is that the CoV-2 antibody cocktail did reduce viral load. That effect was greater in antibody negative patients and greater in those, as I say, you would expect with higher viral loads at baseline. And the majority of that effect is observed within the first three days. No difference in safety outcomes. And uh, I just note that the neutralizing antibody titers, this might uh, surprise you, achieved with this cocktail are more than a thousand times the titers that are seen in convalescent human plasma. Now there's also a casarivimab and imdevimab prevention study. This is an exploratory analysis on 400 evaluable uh, individuals where they received the, the cocktail. And this present, prevented 100% of symptomatic infection and about 50% lower rates of symptomatic and asymptomatic infection combined. These uh, lower numbers occurred uh, in the asymptomatic with decreased peak virus levels and a shorter duration of viral shedding. In fact, the infections occurring, occurring in the placebo group had on average more than 100-fold higher peak viral load. It's interesting that infections in the treatment groups lasted no more than one week, while about 40% of the infections in the placebo group lasted three to four weeks. So it'll be interesting to see if we see differences in so-called uh, uh, long COVID syndrome. And none of the infected individuals in the treatment group had viral loads uh, greater than 10 to the four compared to 62% 
of the infected placebo group. So who can get monoclonal antibody treatment? Well, under the terms of the FDA's EUA, they are only to be used uh, outside of uh, uh, clinical studies for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and pediatric patients who have a positive test for SARS-CoV-2, are within 10 days of their symptoms, are at least 12 and weigh at least 40 kilos, are at high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19 or hospitalization, and who are not hospitalized or on supplemental oxygen. Now, I won't read all of these, but I have the adults on the left side and uh, pediatric 12 to 17 year olds on the right hand side. And they are, as you would expect, individuals who are high risk because of comorbid medical conditions they have or age. So if we look at the IDSA guidelines on uh, uh, BAM monoclonal antibody treatment, they recommend against the routine use of BAM in ambulatory patients. In patients at high risk, it's a reasonable option after informed decision-making and if the patient puts a high value, and I think this is fair to say, on the as yet uncertain benefits and a low value on the adverse events, i.e. more data needs to be accumulated. NIH has a more extensive treatment guideline saying there are no there are currently insufficient data to recommend for or against. So you recommend you, you, you recognize that this is a cautious statement for the use of BAM or the casarivimab and imdevimab cocktail that we've just reviewed. For high-risk patients who meet the criteria, it's appropriate to discuss that as part of shared clinical decision-making. They do go on to say that BAM and the casarivimab and imdevimab cocktail should not be considered the standard of care at this point for the treatment of patients with COVID-19. And that's because there are no comparative data. We need larger studies and uh, longer term data. They also mentioned that patients who are hospitalized should not receive these drugs outside of a clinical trial. And that's because they've not shown benefit that late in the course of disease. ACOG has also issued recommendations regarding the use of monoclonals in pregnancy. And here we need to say they have not yet been tested in pregnant patients. And obviously we need data in order to make a recommendation. They do say though that uh, it could be used in patients with mild to moderate COVID who are at high risk for progressing to severe disease. So this is going to be a, uh, one of those shared clinical decision uh, points between clinician and patient. So one of the issues is that as of December, the federal government had allocated more than a half million doses to states, but only 378,000 doses had actually been distributed. And of those, only 20% of the supply had been used. So we may not be using this at the level that should be considered. I think the reason for that are some challenges, lack of awareness and availability, the EUA mechanism for burdened hospital care systems, the need for IV infusion, some uncertainty about who might progress to severe disease, and the timing. There's a relatively narrow window within which these are appropriately used. There are also issues of cost, questions about efficacy against variant viruses, whether these might have a propensity to drive escape variants, uh, the necessity, as I mentioned, of infusion availability, and a recommendation for delaying immunization for those who have received monoclonals by 90 days. So one of the concerns and questions that I frequently get concerns this idea of escape variants. In other words, would the use of a single monoclonal, monoclonal antibody provide a mutational pressure on the virus to escape that pressure? And I think we have to say that at least theoretically, and there's some early indicators that that is possible. I think that's the reason that manufacturers have gone to using two non-competing monoclonal antibodies. So combination therapy uh, in cases like this, both, uh, again, 
attached to the receptor binding domain and can inactivate uh, viral binding based on that. But at this point, I think that's a good strategy. So in summary, what we can say based on the studies we've reviewed are that monoclonal antibodies reduce viral load and may reduce hospitalization rates and prevent worsening of symptoms among patients who have mild to moderate COVID. BAM, casirivimab, indevimab, uh, and BAM plus edisevimab have received EUA authorization from the FDA. This combination of BAM plus edisevimab reduces viral load and appears to reduce symptoms and hospitalizations. The combination of casirivimab and indevimab reduce viral load, especially in patients who are antibody negative and those who had high baseline viral loads. So it appears that early initiation of treatment in high-risk antibody negative, high viral titer patients is likely to offer the most benefits as indicated by these early hints in these studies. And finally, I think it's the EUA parameters and other factors that do affect uptake or use of these monoclonal antibodies and are leaving many at risk for progression to severe disease. So I wanna thank you for your attention. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. And we hope you'll continue to check back for future installments of Medscape education programs on COVID-19. Thank you for sharing your time with me.